The police killing of Michael Brown and Eric Garner in July and August of 2014 have triggered protests not only in the cities in which those killings occurred, but also throughout this country. And since those shootings, there have been others. Freddie Gray in Baltimore and Walter Lamar Scott in South Carolina. It's plain to me, and I expect to all of you today here, that these protests are not just about the unwillingness to prosecute all but one of those officers for these shootings, but about a long simmering resentment in the African American and Latino communities that the criminal law applies differently to them than it does to white Americans, that the police too often stop and frisk Latino and African American youths with impunity and without reasonable articulable suspicion, that automobiles driven by African Americans, especially in white neighborhoods, are too often stopped by police for driving while black, that the death of a black man at the hands of police is seen as more forgivable than the death of a white man, that prosecutors are less willing to see Hispanic and African American defendants as candidates for rehabilitation who deserve and need a break, and therefore they are more willing to press for mandatory sentences against them, and that more black men age 18 to 21 are in prison or in jail than in college. We can and should debate how accurate the statistical studies are and how accurate these perceptions are, and whether they're more accurate in some states and municipalities than in others. But I think we can agree that these perceptions are accurate more often and in too many places than we would want them to be, and that the perception itself is a reason for great concern, because beyond the statistical studies, we cannot be one nation if a significant percentage of our community members believe they are receiving an inferior quality of justice or no justice at all. The protests have provided an impetus for change, but they can't produce change by themselves. We need to ensure that these protests are different from previous protests and that they don't merely cry out for justice, but actually lead to more justice. And to accomplish that, we need a roadmap for change. And we need to press our leaders in Congress and elsewhere to follow that roadmap and travel to a place where justice is more and fairer. To move past these tragedies, we need to do some concrete things. First, we need to strengthen police community relations by creating community policing models focused on the development of partnerships between police organizations and the communities they serve. How? New infrastructure and architecture. Infrastructure and architecture that might provide the coherence we need and the coherence we need to bring to this enterprise. We need to create in every state federally funded community policing institutes dedicated to creating the tools, templates, training, and best practices for bringing the police and the community members to the table for discussions on how best to keep their communities safe and strong. And we need to increase police transparency by letting the public know what the police are doing. And that can only occur when state and local police departments are required to keep data regarding police stops, searches, and shootings, and to record the race of persons stopped, searched, or shot. Why? Because you can't possibly manage what you don't measure. Transparency also means requiring police 
to install cruiser cameras, to wear body cameras, and to monitor police discretion to turn those cameras off. My last point is about accountability, which means that allegations of police misconduct or situations in which a police officer shoots a civilian should be handled by an independent inspector general. The investigation and prosecutorial decision should not rest in the hands of a district attorney dependent on that police department for its criminal investigations, past and future. So we need police community partnerships, a state institute to support them, cameras, data collection, and an independent inspector general to investigate police misconduct. The roadmap doesn't end here today at this table. The next part is the most difficult. How do we implement it? The system is broken. We need Democrats and Republicans to come together to craft a roadmap to justice and figure out how to fund and implement it. Only then will we be able to create stronger and safer. Although many states mandate peace officer certification and standards for hiring and training, most states exert limited control over their local law enforcement. Outside of consent decrees and the distribution or withholding of federal funds, the influence of the federal government on local policing is also limited. The bottom line is there is no single description of United States police culture and practice. The environment and the challenges faced, faced by police departments vary widely, and the control and oversight of our police is almost exclusively local. The second major factor to consider is that police departments do not operate independently. In most cities, police chiefs are hired or fired by the mayor or another elected municipal executive. Most sheriffs are elected by the voters that they are sworn to protect and serve. While police, when police exert control over citizens, they do so at the behest of an, of an official elected by the people. Crime control strategies don't emerge in isolation, nor do decisions about police accountability. Those decisions are made by independently elected officials and prosecutors. Too often, the scrutiny of disturbing incidents begins and ends with the police department with little examination of those factors outside the agency that influence priorities and practices. The importance of a broader focus of inquiry was illustrated in the recent examination into the government practices in the city of Ferguson. The findings serve as a powerful example of the influence of governing forces outside of the police department itself. Ideas for improving policing in the 21st century need to, need to consider both of these major fact, factors. Most changes in policies and procedures must be adopted by local governments in order to be implemented. For example, the requirement to use body-worn cameras must consider local and state laws related to the gathering, management, and disclosure of data, as well as local and state laws protecting individual privacy. These changes will take time, require a great deal of cooperation, and in some cases the barriers may be insurmountable. There are, however, meaningful steps that can be taken at various levels of government without changing laws. These steps will improve the culture of policing and expand police training in ways that contribute to increased public trust and improved safety. The recommendations of the President's task force range contain a full range of actions that can be implemented Im immediately and some that are more long-term strategies. One of the areas of focus contained in the recommendations relates to police training. Um, I sent to you a copy of an academic report that I co-authored. It was published by the Kennedy School at Harvard and published by the National Institute of Justice. This paper expounds on the importance of addressing the leadership culture in police departments and suggests a path toward improving culture through effective training. I hope these ideas will be beneficial as this committee explores way to improve policing in the 21st century.